Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. The boys are back. You know, we had Michael Brefda, and now we have his brother David, and they're both attorneys, and they're both now in the same firm. So it's called Senior Justice um, Law Firm. So welcome to the show, David. Thanks, Anita. Is there really Senior Justice it is, and I think that uh, my brother, as the founding partner, had a very smart idea with naming the firm Senior Justice to really communicate to our potential clients, this is what we focus on, justice for seniors. Well, and because when you live in South Florida, um, you do notice that so many of the elder population, they don't have families, mm-hmm. and they have to think for themselves, and they often aren't capable of it or don't understand, and so they do get into trouble, don't they? They do. And what would you say would be the worst thing that a person who's listening now, um, once they have deteriorated health, what happens? Ooh, so it's it's a very, very tough situation. And I think that you hit on a good point that oftentimes you need to rely on your family and friends to help you out. Because when you're entering a facility like an assisted living facility or a nursing home, you oftentimes have to make decisions and you might not be capable, be it from other diseases such as dementia or just old age that you might not have the the best decision making skills. So I guess the first recommendation is always to, you know, think about your options if possible. There's a few websites and a few resources that we recommend that our clients look at when thinking about going into a nursing home, for example. Um, There's Medicare.gov. It's a, it's a compare website, nursinghomecompare.com. And they provide a source that you can kind of judge by different metrics of, star ratings for inspections, for, you know, overall rating, for staffing ratings. And I think that's a good start. But you're absolutely right, Anita. It's a very, very difficult uh, process. And as lawyers, we like to kind of be the arbiters and, and the ones that can shine the light on the best choices and, in the worst of times, your ally when things go bad. Shine the light. I like that yeah. very much. That's good. So when I was reading the article that you wrote in the September issue, mm-hmm. Of Boomer Times, I noticed there was, and I'm very involved in this, and I've been doing this for so many years, I didn't know anything about an arbitration agreement. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what it was until I read this. Why don't you explain how that can affect our listeners? Sure, and it, it is a relatively new phenomena in, in these nursing home and assisted living facility uh, contracts. And the reason why is because with political changes, uh, the current political regime has kind of encouraged, especially in the state and in the country encourage these arbitration agreements. Now to break it down what an arbitration agreement is, is usually if you get injured, you have a right to be, have a trial in front of a jury, right? What an arbitration agreement does is sign away that right and instead say, hey, we agree we're not gonna be seen in front of a jury. Instead, we're gonna be seen in front of a neutral arbitrator. And to be fair, there are situations where this is really helpful. For example, uh, it's often used in the business context. So if you're a steel magnate and you're shipping around the world, you might want to say, you know, look, if there's a boating accident off the, the Horn of Africa, we don't want to go to some random court there. We know what we agreed on. We've had multiple iterations of contract. We can set the rules out at the outset. That is not the case with nursing homes. With nursing homes, they have the previous experience because they go through all this all the time. So they write a really one-sided arbitration agreement. And they sneak it in with the admissions contract. And at that point, you're just trying to get a loved one into a facility. So you're like, yeah, I'll sign whatever. Let's, you know, I want care for my loved one. And they, and when you sign that, it can really lead to issues. And the issues are, you know, there's limitations on damages. There's limitations on discovery rules. And we find that, you know, you know, God forbid an injury happens, a settlement or, or an award can be lowered because the arbitration agreement is signed, and it's not in front of a jury. So if someone has a uh, complaint, mm-hmm. can they just bring you in before uh, before anything is serious? I mean, will, how, how do the nursing homes and the rehab centers treat you as a uh, lawyer? They, they do not like <laughs> – I, I like to think good. I'm a friendly-looking guy, but they do not like to see my face, uh, and they don't like to see lawyers. In fact, they, it, they, it used to be that arbitrations agreements would literally say, please talk with a lawyer about this. Because you're giving up a constitutional right. But as the, I guess, the protections around it have been eschewed by the current administration, both state and nationally, they've kind of gotten a little more 
aggressive, shall we say, with the agreements. And they really push the envelope and really try to stack the cards against anyone that would sue them. And what's really funny, Anita, is some of them will even go so far to say this only applies to lawsuits against the facility, not from the facility to the resident. So if they are suing for recovery of rent or something like that, that can go to a court case, but not the other. It, it's so unfair. It's completely unfair. It, it sounds like it. Um, my guest, I, I just said before, is um, David Bresna. And let me just tell you something. David is a partner, though, now uh, in the senior justice law firm. But we do have someone watching, and that's Sean uh, Sean Maltlist. You know the person named that? Anyway, he's watching. Hey, hey Sean. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have a lot of people who just seem to turn turn on and We've even lately had people asking questions oh. on on you know on All the right. Facebook, but because we don't do this on, on well, our shows, put me on the hot seat, Sean. <laughs> right. So uh, let's just move for, further with what you just said. In just make believe someone comes into your office, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's the probably not the person, the the patient, it's probably right. the family member. Right. What what do they say? Give us some different samples. Oh, it could be anything. And I think one of the things that is important to note, Anita, is that when clients come in, they're very scared of wasting our time. And that is never the case because we have a trained eye for these things. We focus on this. We take cases in a variety of, you know, abuse and neglect cases in assisted living facilities and nursing homes. So something I want to tell your listeners is don't be afraid to call. You know, a lot of times we'll be, they'll call and they'll go, I don't know if I have a case. Well, what happened? Well, you know, my mom, she she was she needed assistance with ambulation, walking, and they just kind of let her be, and she fell, and she broke her hip. Well, was she allowed to be alone? No. Well, then, of course, they're negligent. And it's a thing like that, that it's not someone's fault to not know the, the ins and outs of the law. That's our job. But we always request that people give us a call, and just it's completely free. It's no hassle, just to see if you have a case. And the reason why is because... Oftentimes, these facilities will try to pretend it's not a big deal. They'll call you and they'll say, oh, you know, mom fell again, but, you know, she was by herself. There's nothing we could do. It wasn't preventable. Well, that's a conclusion. Let's investigate that. Let's talk about what happened. Let's, what were they on notice about? Was she able to be alone? But, yeah, just to kind of answer your question shortly, it, it's we see falls. We see fractures. We see unexplained bruisings. We see a lot of bed sores, pressure sores that developed when they're not moved. Uh, we see slips. We also see, and this is, is very sad, but we see some sexual assault, which is very shocking. Are you really? Yes. I, we haven't talked about that. It's it's something that is really wild that this occurs because it's not something that you would naturally think would occur at these facilities. But oftentimes, because these facilities are trying to cut corners, they really hire very, very low-end staff, and they don't do appropriate background checks. And sometimes they're sexual predators and sexual predators really, you know, feed off of uh, men and women that are kind of unable to fight back. And that's kind of what happens at a lot of these nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We just had a uh, just said, do you want to tag Michael Brevda in this video? <laughs> sure. Let's bring him in in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens here. OK, I just tagged him. I don't know what's going to happen there. No, but okay. anyway, uh, well, I wanted to ask, though, there are things that could happen in a person's home. Because the home health agency has sent someone in who isn't appropriate. Would that be also a case oh, of handle? Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, because we, we just keep talking about nursing homes. And- sure. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly right, Anita. It's not just nursing homes. We use nursing homes as the catch-all term because a lot of people don't know the differentiations between, for example, an assisted living facility, an independent living facility, a nursing home, home health aides. To them, I, I, to most lay, lay people, I think the idea of nursing home covers elder long-term care. But home health aides, of course, you know, they have duties that they need to, to you know, be responsible for. Oftentimes we'll see uh, home health aides that obscure wounds and they over-bandage them and they don't show the family members. I, I just have, I have a case now where it was two years and they said, you know, the nursing home aide said, or sorry, the home health aide said, we only de-bandage once a day, you know, I'm doing the stuff, don't worry about it. And the family was like, we trust you. You're an expert. We're hiring you. Sure. And once they let go of her and took this, their mom to an actual facility, they're like, you have a stage four bed sore, you know, and it's, it's absolutely wild. Yeah. Uh, so, so you really are doing such a good service. I mean, I know it's your 
I'll call it a business now because you're a lawyer and this mm-hmm. is the, the particular um, specific um, type of law that you want to practice. But when mm-hmm. you still really think about it, it's so important, especially here in South Florida, because I, I just know with over medication, I'm not, you know, I'm not mm-hmm. talking about anything that's even so serious, but there's a lot of over medication oh. that doctors could be really involved in. They don't pay attention. And then, of course, the seniors themselves go to different doctors and mm-hmm. they don't tell the other doctor. And it's really bad. But it's but you're sure. um, so I want to go back to how you get. So if people are listening, how you actually get your clients. So um, one of the family members, the husband or the wife or, mm-hmm. or someone comes in, uh, the, maybe the adult children come in. And then once they talk to you, what do you do next? So the first thing that we always ask, and this this is a firm policy, and it's also a good human policy. You know, I have to take my lawyer hat off sometimes, too, and think as a human being. If If you think your mom or dad was being abused or neglected, try to move if you can. There are great services, geriatric care managers that can transfer facilities. And the reason why is oftentimes we'll get calls where someone goes, they're not washing mom, they're not taking care of her, she seems really depressed. And while that alone isn't a case, I get a call six months later, they dropped her. And and the thing is, these are red flags. So even if it's not a case, get out because there are better and there are worse. You know, I'm not going to try to write a check I can't cash. You know, these facilities by and large are understaffed and overwhelmed and don't do the best job. But some are better than others. And like I said, I think when you talk to a geriatric care manager who ha- knows the in and outs of each facility, the staffing, the, the type of aid they can give, they're much better suited. And you never want to leave someone in that bad situation. You are so superb. I have to tell you that I've talked to so many people when I mention geriatric care manager, they say, what's that? <laughs> no, it's an incredible source. It's a whole new yeah, profession. And of it's course. that someone does watch over everything. Yeah. But, you know, it's... I guess this is a new wave of what's happened in our society. It is. And we know that boomers and seniors and people are living 80, 90, 100 years old. And mm-hmm. it is very difficult for someone to, you know, they might be on certain medications. They can't get to their doctor. I, I will tell you, though, I was very fortunate. I have a, um, uh incredible new, um, I have a relationship now with an incredible um, home health agency. Mm. And I just say kind care. Kind care at home, and I, I, I don't find a lot because of what mm-hmm. you've been telling me. And that's what people have to do. They have to check everything out. So you, as a law firm, though, you're kind of at the, I think, at the bottom, in a sense. Okay. It's after, <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, yeah. a good bottom. But yes. The point is that they should do everything you said. They should check out everybody first. Mm-hmm. They should keep a watch. But there are a lot of people who aren't even around to do that. That's the problem. And that's the trouble. And it, but you shouldn't be punished for that either. You know, it's a very difficult process. And, you know, God forbid something happens. That's what we're here for, yes. to try to seek justice for you. And I, I think an important thing to note, Anita, and you've kind of talked about it, is that oftentimes people don't even know how to pursue these. So a lot of these cases of neglect and abuse go completely unreported in the way that you know, the state agencies work, they're, they're overwhelmed. They don't have time to look into this stuff. In fact, when you bring a case, you're not fighting just for yourself or your loved ones, but everyone who doesn't have a voice to fight for the, against those abuses. Absolutely. And, and actually, this is going to sound crazy, but I think that there are many operators and people who own really good nursing mm-hmm. homes and, and rehab centers, and they should appreciate you because they don't maybe know what's going on. And oh, maybe yeah. because you have been hired by somebody and mm-hmm. you're bringing up something that they should be watching for. Otherwise they could have 20 people oh, suing, of course, and, suing them. And you're absolutely right. Nina. I, I just actually just had a case against a facility where there was a new change in ownership. And so I spoke with a lot of the prior employees and they were fantastic. They were amazing. And everyone said these guys were great until the new owners came in. And what I find from experience is it's not the individual nurses. It's not even the ED. What it is is the owners, because what they do is they strip, strip, strip. They don't improve, they don't hire enough, and they let things go to waste because they make more money. And and, and a lot of people get angry at the CNAs, and and I understand, it's it's but it's a difficult job, you know. What they're doing, what they need, is they need to be staffed appropriately, and none of them do, or most of. I don't want to say no. No, no, but but, you are so right. You are just hitting on the best subjects. You're just perfect. We have mm -hmm. another watcher, Lynn Miller, is watching. Hi, Lynn. But let, let me tell you, because my husband was in a rehab center, a very good center, and I know that there on weekends 
mm-hmm. they're of course they don't have as many people, oh, which is stupid. It's very. It might stupid. be a weekend for certain people, but mm-hmm. it's not a weekend for the people who are staying the there. The residents live there every so, day. So that's that's one problem. The other thing is they have a lot of people who are really good aides instead of doing the things you said, you know, cleaning mm-hmm. them, keeping them. They're serving the meals. Mm-hmm. And it takes a while to serve the meals. And I used to complain about, why are you doing this? Well, there's no one else to do it. See, that's what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. These facilities need to have, it. you know, used to say ratio staff, mm-hmm. two to one. <laughs> yeah. Know? That's like 10 to one or uh, 20 to one sometimes, right? Yeah. Well, I wish those were the numbers. That's not what it's like nowadays. I and I, I know you know this, Anita, but it, it, it's they're supposed to staff to acuity. That's not me making this up. That's actually federal law from the late 80s. And they don't do that. They, 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 and, and to add insult to injury, the money that they take in is often from Medicare and Medicaid. So not only are they understaffing and hurting our seniors and a lot of our veterans too, which is even more. That's another subject. But they're stealing from the U.S. taxpayer while doing so. So it's definitely makes me sleep well at night that I'm fighting these guys because they are awful, awful. Yeah, and maybe you know we did start out with the uh, arbitration agreements. Let's go back to that in the time sure. we have left. What should someone do when they do go into a a nursing home or rehab center? Should they not sign them? I'm glad you asked, Anita, because I was going to go back there as well. Uh, Yes, most of the time it's an optional agreement. Most of the time. If it's optional, say no. Literally just say, I don't want to sign this. Sometimes it'll say mark an X through it, then mark an X. And the reason why is because there is zero benefit to you. Absolutely none. If you read through their their idea of, or their I guess their um, analysis on why you should, they allege that it lowers costs for you. It doesn't. They allege that it's speedier. It's actually not because you don't have a judge that can punish the opposing counsel for slowing things down. So it really serves no benefit except for the facility. So do not sign it. But I do want to say if you did sign it, it doesn't mean you don't have a case. And I, I want to stress that as well because a lot of people that are now learning about this, they go. Oh, David, it's a case, but I signed an arbitration agreement. Well, there's a lot of things that we can do to invalidate arbitration agreements. Oftentimes, they'll have people sign them who don't have the right. They're not power of attorney, or they'll have a resident sign it who is declared mentally incompetent. These things invalidate it. Additionally, there are public policy arguments, which I won't delve too deep into, but they can't limit punitive damages. They can't limit non-compensatory damages. So, we can at least strike those from, at minimum, strike them from the arbitration agreement to make them fair. But even if you sign an agreement and it's going to stand, you still have a case. It's still heard before arbitrators. It still can be settled. So it doesn't mean don't pursue a claim. But to, to say it briefly, as you asked, Anita, don't sign if you have the choice. David Mulhern is watching. Hey, David. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I as you're talking about that, I was thinking you said something before. If it doesn't seem right, leave. Go somewhere else then. Yes. When you're coming to, to, you know, that's when they first make you sign everything. Mm-hmm. And if they're giving you a hard time, then maybe that's not the right place for you, right? Well, it, it, would, it would strike me as a red flag if I'm bringing my mother or father into a facility and the thing that they're most focused on is me signing away my right in a potential future lawsuit. I would go, hmm, why are they doing that? Are they expecting me to sue them? Are they expecting to abuse or neglect my mom or dad? That's what I would be thinking. But – Again, it, it is it is now industry practice, so I would be shocked for you to enter a facility where they don't at least try to get you to sign the arbitration agreement. But like I said, it's mostly optional, so just please, please, please do not sign it. There's no benefit to you. It only benefits the facility. Okay, so the end result with people, mm-hmm. they've hired you. You've seen that things are, you know, haven't been going right, and so you, are you – is there a suit? Is that what it goes for with a jury? How, how does it wind well, up? Well, so there are special rules that were made for nursing home and assisted living facility cases. There's a mandatory pre-suit period. So as an example, if you're outside and a car hits you, you can just go and sue the next day. You can file a complaint. You can't do that in a nursing home case. And that's because of legislative changes that were made in Florida to kind of dissuade these type of cases, which is a shame. But what what happens, the first thing that happens is you come in, we talk. If there's a case that we want to pursue, we ask for the medical records. We look through them, and we'll send what it's called a notice of intent. It's a notice of intent to sue. And first, we need to make a good faith basis based on the medical records and what we've discussed in the death certificate, et cetera, et cetera, if, if applicable. And from there, we start that mandatory pre-suit process. And if it doesn't resolve in that pre-suit period, then we can file the complaint. 
then the lawsuit starts, the depositions, the hearings, et cetera, et cetera, if that makes sense. It does. But so my question is, since everything is based on the records, how do you know the records are? <laughs> Ooh, I mean, that's, that's right. That's right. Know, so how do you really? But what would you do? So we're, we're dealt have, the hand we're me, given. You have to take what they give yes, you. Yes, exactly. But then, I can't say, hey, this doesn't look right. But what I can say is I can find inconsistencies in the record, which happen frequently. Remember, at a hospital or at a nursing home, these people are working really hard. They only have a minute to write it in. So f- for a coordinated kind of conspir- conspiratorial doctor, nurses, aides situation, it would be really complex and they probably wouldn't be able to do it. So most of the time when we see records, we find what we need to find. It's there, you know, and especially when there's an emergent transport from a facility to a hospital, whether it's a fall, a bed sore, a, you know, a brain bleed like a subdural hematoma, then the records will show because they don't want it. They don't want anyone to think it was them. So the, the hospital will really be detailed and saying, hey, you know, so and so came in with the stage four bed sore on their on their uh, coccyx. So and so came in, with, you know, from a fall brain bleed. Someone came in with a, a fractured hip because they don't want responsibility. So the medical records aren't usually. We're not usually afraid of it so being falsified. So they're not falsified. tampered with unless it's something really major is what you're, yeah, you're saying. Yeah, I, I never want to say never because I wouldn't yeah. put it past, right. especially some of the facilities. But If it's major, major, they just might just do that, right? I, Depending I think on they, the owners. Exactly. And that's what you were saying. Exactly. I think that's right. And, and frankly, if they try, they'll probably end up in more trouble. So it's better for their, themselves to not even try it because we'll find it, you know. Well, I know that your brother, uh, Michael, has been doing this for quite a while. And, mm-hmm. and I know that uh, when he's here, he does talk about some of the cases and and um, are there there are ways to settle though? Aren't there? Yes. That going. So why don't you explain? It's not they don't all go to court. No, no, they don't all go to court. And something that we hear from clients a lot is, you know, David, I don't want to be in a three year lawsuit. I don't want to have to go through twenty depositions and be up on trial. All of this, and and we fully understand. And you know, most of the cases do settle. Some even as early as the pre suit settlement period that I was discussing before. So you're talking. 45 days in and it, it really depends on the client and it really depends on the opposing counsel and the, and the opposing party because some facilities are honest and legitimate and will offer legitimate, you know, settlement offers and some won't. And it's all a game of getting to the point. <clears throat> again, this is not, we're not talking med mal cases where it's a complex treatment of some obscure disease. These are pretty clear liability issues. So, <clears throat> sorry. So they kind of know that they're in trouble. They know that they're probably going to lose. It's a question of the valuation of that. And, uh, you know, settlement happens when, when the agreement is, uh, you know, something palatable to our clients and something palatable to theirs. And it does happen a lot. So I don't want to dissuade anyone into thinking that this is going to be a three year process because usually it's not. Well, I want to go back and, uh, remember during the hurricane and down mm-hmm. in Hallandale, what happened remember. with their. Ugh. What what happened there though? Now what how, what did they do? Did well, the state came in? But it, well, it's funny did you say each that. Each one have a lawyer. How did this happen? Well, they ha- they did have legal representation, but it's funny you bring that up because a case that I'm on right now, uh, there were laws passed after the fact that they needed to have generators to keep the facilities at a certain uh, temperature for a certain amount of days. And this facility that I was mentioning before that has the new owners, they failed that multiple times. And staff was like, hey, you need to change this. And they said, and I have this in sworn affidavits, we're not going to fix that. You're not going to get a cent out of me. Are you kidding? Nope. I, I literally had an uh, the director, the DON, the ED, and uh, another nurse say, this is the worst facility I've ever worked at in my last 25 years. So I just so want now what? Well, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're in the pre-suit process. We're having a mediation point coming up, I think in early October and we told we told them we said hey look this is a bad case you know if, if you want to settle this if you're coming in earnest and you think it's worth and you know we threw around some numbers a range we if you think it's worth that show up if not don't don't waste our time don't waste our clients time we'll keep going well I would think also something like this could hit the newspapers I mean they oh, they could yeah. lose so much it, and you know when you're I think when you're suing someone I think it it um, it's like a conversation. It's oh, going to go all throughout the facility, and they're going to lose in the in the long run. And and I want to be positive too, just as you of are. Course. You're a very positive person. I think that most people who got into the business of taking care of elders mm-hmm. really want to do that. But if they're not 
they don't hire the right people and they don't watch of over course. everything, it's going to fall apart. I 100% agree. And right. I think I think the, the real people, the real criminals here are the ones that are like these far away, you know, shell company owners. It's not it's not the people that study to do this. You know, it, it's hedge, hedge fund managers in New York that somehow happened on an asset profile that included these facilities. We call it heads and bits. There you go. It, yeah, you, you look exactly. at the numbers, they go, wait, we can make a little more by doing this, this, and this. Who cares about the care? We don't care. We're in some hedge fund in New York or Chicago. And, and we, we see this as an industry change, that it's pr- so much more profit-focused than it used to be, which is a shame. Well, I tell you then, and I can use the name because they did the right thing. Uh, years ago, when... Um, when senior living really came in strong here in Boca Raton, the Marriott mm-hmm. took over or just built a beautiful facility. And it was well run. Everything was great. It was a independent. Mm-hmm. And I knew some of the people living there. And they were so happy. And then things got a little bit less because I believe that the Marriott didn't understand the 24-hour, you know, seven-day-a-week, 30-day mm-hmm. months. Right? They didn't know this. Once they realized they couldn't do it profitably, they did sell it. Yep. They got rid of it because they didn't want their name associated with something, and they saw that it wasn't what they attempted to be. Right. So the new organization that came in, I could tell for the residents, residents, oh, they were complaining about this and that mm-hmm. because the Marriott was very luxurious. Everything was done well. And so that's a perfect thing. And because the company came in, I think they had a lot of them all over the country because that, you know, they saw this as, wow, this is a great new way to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But they didn't really understand that. When you, and especially places that are co- costing a great deal of money. These oh, yeah. aren't the low-level times even. No, no. And, and even they should be treated properly. So you were so right when you said this. I mean, unfortunately, we see that now with doctors' practices. Oh, yeah. We see a lot of the business people sure. coming in and the poor doctors, you know, they're they're being... <laughs> well, it, it's systemic and you're exactly right, Anita. It's It's a question of, you know, where do we want our medical treatment to be? How do we want it to be viewed? Is it just like any other business? Is it selling Nike shoes? I don't want it that way. And, you know, the the, the truth of the matter is, is that everyone you know is going to, like, friend, family, is going to put someone in a home, in, in a facility at some point. And if we don't actively try to fix this now, it might even be you. And and it's one of those things that if or we it take, might be them. Yes. The, what, the very person right. who's the... Uh, <laughs> oh, the, I mean, I, I would assume right. these crazy hedge fund people have so much money that they're going to be fine and they're yeah. going to have... Uh, uh, you know, but, but again, it, everyone deserves care. Everyone deserves treatment and everyone deserves, a, you know, a nice place to be. The phone number, the office is 561-717-0817, 561-717-0817. And I mean, you are just so interested. I want to give your website too. It's seniorjustice.com. Perfect. We'll see you again another time. Thanks so much. Bye. Looking forward to it.